Uh, greetings, everybody. It's Chapla Trap House coming at you this Monday. Uh, before we get into today's uh, quite barn burner of an episode, you guys are going to really enjoy what's coming up. But December 8th, Buffalo, New York, Asbury Hall. Tickets still available to our live show at chapotraphouse.com slash live. Tickets available once again that date, December 8th, that location, Asbury Hall, Buffalo. Come see us live soon. Now, on to the show. Uh, hey, everybody, it's Chapo Trap House, November 22nd, 2021. And if that date seems significant to you, you've probably been listening to our show too long. Uh, it is today the 58th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. And in just a little bit, we'll be talking to Aaron Good, editor at large of Covert Action Magazine. But before then, we are thrilled and honored to be joined by the director of JFK and the recently released JFK Revisited Through the Looking Glass, Oliver Stone. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, William. All right. So I want to talk about the movie. But, uh, but before we get into that, I just was like, the, you know, the a recent news item from just the other week involving uh, President Joe Biden ordered yet another delay in the release of secret files related to the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Uh, in a White House memo signed by Biden, he said temporary continued postponement is necessary to protect against identifiable harm to the military defense, intelligence operations, law enforcement, or the conduct of foreign relations that is of such gravity that it outweighs the public interest in immediate disclosure. So uh, just when you, when you heard about this, Oliver, I mean, w- first of all, what could you think this, uh, what, what do you think this identifiable harm could be referring to? And more broadly, what does this say to you about the ongoing success or failure of the men who plotted this murder and uh, their efforts continuing on uh, even beyond the grave? Well, <laughs> uh, well, just first of all, let me just say it. I'm a little disappointed because Joe Biden is an Irish Catholic and he should, he owes uh, John Kennedy a, a, a debt as a first Irish Catholic president. And, <laughs> and it seems to be, you know, and I think in his heart, he's a good man, but I don't uh, understand what, you know, it just seems like more double talk from the government. The government itself is classifying more documents than ever before. I hear it. There's a record number, uh, thousands of documents that just declare top secret every day. So it's kind of become our government's become a, a covert government in exile, really. It's just not there anymore. It's not responding to the people. And I feel that very much so. I mean, what they take polls and people say, well, we're, we're against this war or that war. We're against this. And it doesn't make any difference. They just do what they're going to do. So it's kind of debilitating and depressing over time. I don't believe, you know, we've been on this case a long time. I still believe I made the movie and I, I, you can judge it for yourself. It's a very strong documentary about what the real case is, what the, what the evidence leads to. And people should pay attention because the Warren Commission is not the answer at all. It's, it, it's a farce. We, we destroy their, their case. Uh, bit by bit, we destroy it. I want to talk about the, uh, the documentary in a second. And it is, like you said, I think a very, a, a very cogent and well-assembled uh, a brief that at the very least, the Warren Commission is a complete fraud. But, but before we get into the movie, I just wanted to ask you, uh, do you remember in your own mind, like, do you remember a moment when the first incongruity in the official account of the Kennedy assassination that disturbed you or led you to conclude that there was something dramatically wrong with what you were being told? Well, first of all, let me just say, I don't believe it's a complete fraud. I do believe there was well intention. Some people were well intentioned and they did their best, but there was no real investigation. There was no desire to uncover anything other than the three bullet, one gunman scenario, which allowed our country, so to speak, they thought to go on without disturbance, which is to say, if one man does it and he's a lunatic and, we, and we've solved the case, there's no need to, to discuss the whys, why he was killed and what we're doing and what the, the Johnson administration is doing that the Kennedy administration was not doing. All those things get overlooked and the narrative of history continues. So that's very important to realize. I don't think it was a completely fraudulent document, but definitely a wrong, wrong and not well-intentioned by having Alan Dulles uh, basically running the commission. 
was a was a huge mistake because he was fired by Kennedy and he was a CIA chief. And as to your other question, uh, which was what again, I'm sorry. Uh, do you remember like in your own mind, like the, oh, the no. first? No, I, 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 no I, I accepted the conventional story. I was in boarding school at the time and I was 17 years old. Everybody was very sad and shocked. And uh, I, I didn't think much about it, except I saw the Mark Lane stuff. It was it was interesting, but I didn't get into it until actually 1988 or so when I was uh, after I'd done Platoon in Wall Street. I was uh, approached by a woman, Ellen Ray, who had published uh, Jim Garrison's uh, version of the of the assassination on the trail of the assassins. After I read Garrison's book, no question, there was a lot of questions in my mind. And I met with Garrison. I met with many people down there in New Orleans, in the South, in Washington. And I was on my way towards making the movie. Well, in, in the most recent movie, in the documentary that you just released, um, I would say that like uh, the, the case presented basically pre presents three main areas of inquiry that you use to marshal uh, this case. And I'd like to talk a little bit about each one of them. The first being the forensics of the murder itself, the bullet, the autopsy, and the eyewitness accounts. Now, as to the forensics, which I think can be sometimes the, the most difficult thing to communicate to a popular audience, I'll, I just want to like focus on uh, the bullet. This is probably the most ridiculous thing that's in the Warren Report, but could you talk a little bit about the pristine bullet where it was found and the uh, just the the idea that a bullet could be in perfect condition after, according to the Warren report, having gone through Kennedy and Governor Connolly. Well, it's ridiculous. It's Alice in Wonderland, as we said, beyond you know, the looking glass, because the this this magic bullet shows up in the hospital. Uh, it's found by a, the foreman there, one of the janitors, and it makes its way up. But it's not. We don't even know the chain of custody of that bullet. You see, it's it, we don't know that that is the bullet. Uh, there's, it's the chain of custody is not there, and that's thrown out of court. There's, the chain of custody is off on everything. It's off on the rifle too. We don't know what that was the rifle. We don't know the bullets, the uh, the wounds, the autopsy reveals again a chain of custody. We don't have none of the, the autopsy was done by a, 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 a military team who didn't have much experience in these in gunshot wounds like this murders, and they they didn't want to open it up and have civilian uh, forensics, which were much better. And unfortunately, a lot of misinformation crept in, which we pointed out in the autopsy, including, we believe, a doctored photos of his, uh, of his, of his body. Additionally, to the, the primary evidence, the other problem is the identity of the shooter, which we call into question, which is the, uh, the, the Lee Harvey Oswald scenario it makes no we know that he has been working with a, as an asset of the CIA for four years. He's been followed. He's been they know where he is. He's been used. He's been sent to Russia as a defector. They opened his mother's mail for four years. practically. Uh, he's definitely in the sights of the CIA. And we don't know. We know a lot about the people he met. But this is all very secretive area because James Angleton, the counter counterterrorism chief of the CIA, very strange character, walled off that his file from anything else are not available. And that would be a nice file to see if we ever could find it. I don't know if it's still in existence. And of course, we have stories of the, the three women who were at the Warren Committee. They were secretaries and they're very, very, uh, very good witnesses, but they were, they saw, they, they were on the fourth floor when the shooting occurred. They went down the stairs, two of them went down the stairs immediately, and they never saw an Oswald coming down those stairs. And that, it, the, so the whole scenario of him shooting and running out, the, running out of the sixth floor quickly, leaving everything behind and disappearing down the, into the traffic, into into the street, is nonsense. It looks like there was nobody on the sixth floor at, at this point in time. Nobody, and that, so the identity of the shooter. And then the other thing that we bring up into into the film, besides all the evidence, is the issue of why he was killed what the outcome was, what were the reasons? Well, um, actually, let's, let's talk about that, because like, I guess the, the third part is, is sort of like you talk about Oswald, the, the, the figure, the man, and the details about his life that would lead one to, to believe that he was probably a part of an intelligence operation. The third and sort of broadest case, and it's, it, it's, it's the one that involves, I, I think, the most amount of um, 
like you, you, you have to lead to a certain amount of speculation because the nature of the case means that like a lot of this stuff will be secret. But I think like for those who are inclined to be skeptical, I think the line people take is that uh, the CIA wouldn't have had to have orchestrated some plot to remove him from office or even kill him because he wasn't really a threat to like, you know, ending the Cold War or anything like that. Could you talk about the national security memos um, that you bring up that, that I think make a very good case that he was looking to, I don't know, bring the temperature down on the Cold War and specifically not to get U.S. troops directly involved in Vietnam? Oh, it's much bigger than that. It was a much bigger change. He was working on a broad scenario and he was in danger of being reelected in 1964. As a second term president, he would have much more power. He was bringing the whole concept of detente to the Cold War, the concept of a peace. He was talking about peace in his last speech at the American University, the peace speech, peace between the Soviet Union and the United States. Very eloquent speech and peace for the sake of the world. He had been through the nuclear missile crisis of October 62. He knew how close we had come to nuclear catastrophe. He, so did Khrushchev, his opposite in the, in the, the Kremlin and together, and with Robert Kennedy, they they saved that the, the, they uh, they saved the world basically from blowing up. Uh, the, the Pentagon and the CIA wanted to invade Cuba. They wanted to invade with, in spite of everything, with bombing and go in full American invasion, get the Russians out. Well, Kennedy and Khrushchev brokered the deal, got the Russians out, removed the missiles. At the same time, Kennedy qu quietly agreed to take out the American missiles from Turkey. That's all behind the scenes. And what happened essentially was that we we're on a road to coexistence, which is important. Uh, Kennedy, a piece of legislation that was passed in, in September of 63 was a nuclear test ban treaty. Nobody, I can't emphasize how important that was, how important it is to, that was the first treaty that the United States and Soviet Union had been able to make on, on this level. No atmospheric, no more atmospheric testing. That was huge. On top of that, he was talking about a space cooperation with the Soviets. He was talking about a general detente, a loosening of the tensions that had been building up over the, through the 1950s. The military establishment, the CIA, were so ready to fight. They were ready to go to war because essentially we were much better equipped for nuclear war than the, than the Soviets were. We, we had much more, many more missiles. There was no missile gap. That was one of the big issues, of course. Kennedy found out the moment he was elected, and he went to, with McNamara, his Secretary of Defense, that the United States was way over, had way too many uh, nuclear missiles. The Soviets had very few. So it was a disbalance there. But the, the bigger point is that he wanted to, to lower the, as you call it, lower the temperature, not only with the Soviet Union, but in, in, in Cuba, too. He, he made feel, he put feelers out. Two or three people of his, friends of his, talked to Castro. There was a, he wanted to get this uh, cooled down, the, the Cuba situation. And on Vietnam, there's no question, his, because now we have more evidence from declassified files that he was withdrawing troops in 63, but essentially all of them in 65, because win or lose, he was going to pull out of Vietnam. It was up to the Vietnamese government to, 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 to fight if they wanted to fight. And this is confirmed by Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, in cables that we have. And we see the declassified files of the meetings. And on top of it, McNamara wrote about this in his book after my movie came out. So did National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy. No question Kennedy was pulling out of Vietnam. So historians have to realize that they're getting it wrong when they say Johnson transitioned smoothly. Johnson changed the whole policy. He went into a hard hardball situation right away, didn't want to make any compromises and fully supported the South Vietnamese corrupt government and got us into the war, which Kennedy never would have gotten us into. So you have a whole, it's, it's a worldwide situation. I mean, uh, specifically, you talk about the, uh, the Bundy memo, NSAM 273, where, which Johnson changes within a week of Kennedy's death to completely reverse a paragraph about um, the commitment of American forces to Vietnam directly, not just in terms of advisors. But Kennedy was clear that to his people that he was willing to accept the loss of South Vietnam. Yes, he said that, and so did McNamara, and so did... Uh so did Nick George Bundy, and so did many people around Kennedy. So it's out of the, it's no longer contestable. It's really, we don't know what could have happened, but certainly 
Kennedy was in a very tough position because he realized he'd been elected as a cold warrior, that you couldn't be anything else in the United States in the 1950s, 1960 election. You had to be, you had to, you know, since the McCarthy era, the United States has been belligerent and saying that we have to roll back communism. Big issue, big issue. And it depended to what extreme you were willing to go to roll back communism. I mean, to, to that to that question about like the uh, a skeptic would say might say like, oh, he ran as a Cold Warrior. He was from a staunchly sort of right wing Catholic family, uh, ardently anti communist. Like, you know, uh, why 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 kill him if that was the case? And I think honestly, one of the more persuasive pieces of evidence that you present in the film is the case of Charles de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle being probably even more of a right wing figure than Kennedy, a great hero of World War II. But you have in the movie, uh, Kennedy told the French ambassador that he wasn't entirely confident that he was in complete control of his own government, i.e. the CIA, and that they had tried to essentially have de Gaulle assassinated a number of times because he was willing to let go of Algeria. So what do you think they would do to John F. Kennedy for letting go of South Vietnam? Of course. There was, well, we never had South Vietnam. Kennedy uh, was not willing to go there. So it wasn't like the French situation. The French had, were a colonial power. They'd gone back into Vietnam. Kennedy traveled to Vietnam in 1950s with his brother and actually saw the situation firsthand and knew the French were in a very impossible situation. He was totally anti-colonial, totally. In his all his uh, efforts with with France, with Vietnam, and also with Algeria, he made a speech on the Senate floor that got him into a lot of hot water against the French occupation of Algeria. It was on the cover of Time magazine. He was a even Adlai Stevenson, who was the Democratic candidate, asked him not to make any more speeches about it. In other words, he he, he certainly crossed swords with the uh, avowed policy of the United States to fight communism. He he was a it was a delicate situation and. In, in Africa, he certainly, uh, when after Lumumba was killed, he was shocked. He didn't even know the CIA was involved, but he investigated with Dag Hammarskjöld the crime and tried to bring uh, peace to the Congo. He also was very involved with Indonesia, with Sukarno, which, of course, all these things backfired after he died. Lyndon Johnson took a hard line on Indonesia, which resulted in a massacre out there in 1965. And then he took a very hard line on Africa. He took a hard line on Soviet, uh, on Soviet issues. And on Cuba, there was, well, Cuba ended up as a stall. It was a new, it, it stalled out, but there was a very hot issue there. Lyndon Johnson also in the movie, if you remember, talks to, uh, on the phone to Robert McNamara and says, I was not, as you know, he saw the McNamara, he says, hey, you know, I was, I did not agree with you and the president's uh, idea of pulling out of Vietnam. He says it bluntly. Well, I mean, on, on the sort of the final part of the movie, which speaks to this this broader moment, uh, sorry, motive. And I got to say, I really appreciated that you switch narrators for this section of the movie from Whoopi Goldberg to Donald Sutherland, uh, sort of uh, re recalling his great role in the in the, the original film JFK as the sort of Mister X figure that Kevin Costner talks to, and gives voice to this idea of what is the motive for the national security state to kill the president. And uh, what, what you're talking about here is a moment in which a you know, president who is, you know, close election, democratically elected, well, depending on, you know, who, who you talk to. But there was a moment in which the, the American people had a choice to live in a more peaceful world than the one that we created in the second half of the 20th century. And that, that was essentially stopped with the Kennedy assassination. So, I mean, like what are, I mean, just could you speak on the broader like implications of the world that we're living in that has been directly traced to this murder in Dallas? To begin with, you can say that no American president since Kennedy, since Kennedy has been able to curb, to change the military situation or the intelligence agency situation. We're stuck with these two dinosaurs and they're gigantic. They become gigantic, more and more fed, more and more and more blown up, giving us bigger and bigger threat inflations, telling us not only that the Russians were out to get us, but now. It seems the Chinese are out to get us, and it seems like we're in facing uh, Iran is out to blow up the world. And that, uh, in other words, we have, in, and of course, Cuba it has to is still a, a, the evil regime, and Venezuela has to go. In other words, we create these situations that are, and we make them much more dangerous than they are. This is an American pattern since World War II. Um, and then, like in Dallas, 
on November 22nd, 1963. You had, of course, Kennedy himself. But in the city of Dallas on that day are Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, and George H.W. Bush, three future U.S. presidents. Do you think that what happened sort of, I don't know, provided a sort of example of what happens when, if you try to govern outside the, the sort of set parameters of what the you know uh, Pentagon and CIA would have you, um, just in terms of like the parameters set by them as it regards engagement with the rest of the world? Yeah, well, certainly. And Lyndon Johnson, you can say the same thing. The bullets flew over his head. <laughs> yeah. I think the first, one of his first lines of dialogue was, was to Hoover was, were they shooting at me? Were they shooting at me? It kind of sells you a lot. Uh, you know, no American president has been able to go there. Kennedy had a lot of guts to do this, to try to tamp down the temperature. I think his model was, was Roosevelt. The Roosevelt uh, people had been there. New Deal, liberal liberalism was popular. And then, of course, it got buried in this World War II mobilization. And after the war was over, the people who ran the country, the, uh, the, the financiers, the industrialists, said, well, we're going to go back into a depression unless we keep this militarization of the economy going. And that's what they did, essentially. They, they put a, a huge amount of people into the, into the defense industries. They built them up enormously. Eisenhower, with missiles in 1950s, the budget enormous, the amount of missiles built, we, we loaded up and we, it was a false stimulus, I think a very dangerous one. And we created this monster that's become bigger and bigger with the lobbies around the industry, the, in, the defense industry, and without, we can't stop them. Every time there's any kind of muzzle trying to be put on, you have all these lobbyists moving against it. So it's just, we're, it's, we're stuck. And Kennedy, I think, was the last possibility of really penetrating this deep state apparatus and ending it, or at least uh, I, don't, I think it would have been a battle, but I think he could have done something at that time. It was only 20 years in, into this new regime. It was 20 years after the end of the Cold War, after the end of Hot War, I mean, 1945 on. So that, I, I see that, I mean, it's, to me, it's a very sad story, a tragic story about the uh, the growth of uh, of uh, of America into a militarized country that we have become. It's uh, it's portrayed in the feature film JFK, and I and I've alluded to here. But following on the heels of J John F Kennedy's assassination, then years, a couple years later, you have the assassinations of both Martin Luther King and John F Kennedy's brother Robert Kennedy. Uh, both of those cases contain similarly baffling and absurd distortions of common sense in the sort of public presentation of the facts regarding those assassinations. I'm wondering, I, I remember, a while, I, did I, is it correct that you were at one time considering doing a movie about Martin Luther King Jr. and the, that assassination? Oh yeah, twice, twice, twice. And like, do you think that it's in, in some ways harder to um, accept, like, because, you know, like, I, I think, you know, the American public broadly believes that the, at the very least that there was more to what happened in Dallas than was officially presented or that there's evidence of a conspiracy. Do you think it's harder to discuss the murders of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy in the same context? Not at all. I think it's very important to see the context uh, in the Martin Luther. You know, Kennedy had his own problems with the South. People don't know this, but there's he had quite a bit of a civil rights uh, story. I mean, it was a very tough position for him, but he took action in Mississippi and in Alabama with George Wallace and against the, the Mississippi governor to put James Meredith in the college at University of Mississippi. And in uh, Alabama, he, two, two young black students were enrolled over tremendous opposition, tremendous opposition. They beat up the marshals in Mississippi that were sent there. I mean, it was, it was a war practically to get a civil war. He had there was a lot of anger about his position in the South, which is why we cut to the George Wallace clip saying he's not going to get reelected in the fall of 64. He's got a lot of enemies down here in the South. So I think King uh, brought all that to a head. King brought it all to a head and it culminated in killing King. After King, the situation for them, for the segregationists, cooled down. I mean, although there was a lot of... Uh, the march on Washington had disturbed them greatly, but after that, the uh, the, the march on poverty, the, the the king's final goal, was defanged. 
with, with Robert Kennedy, you have a case where if he had been elected, he, I think it was pretty clear from all the people around him who were, that he would reinvestigate the case of his brother's murder. And if that was the case, that was dangerous for them. Very dangerous because there were a lot of loose ends. There was a lot of things that were involved. And if he was going to undertake the same program as Kennedy, which, which was against the Vietnam War, against militarization of, and all the things that Kennedy stood for, including the fight against poverty, you know, that's very important. The money would be spent in the wrong direction. So that was the, the there was a reaction to the to the to the Kenneth candidacy, candidacy, and he was killed right away before they could get out of hand. No question. But you know, in the uh, in the the assassins themselves, in James Earl Ray and Sirhan Sirhan, I mean, do you see any evidence? I mean, like, do you think a case can be made that they, like Lee Harvey Oswald, were also patsies? Somewhat similar, somewhat similar patterns. Oswald was an asset that they were using. He was a patsy, and I, 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 I you know, I, I actually interviewed uh, James Earl Ray. You know, I, I saw him and talked to him, but you know, it's hard to say because. He doesn't seem like a man who could do anything on his own like that. He certainly was used. We know that from all the traveling after the assassination. And it goes on. That's a, that's a, it's a mystery, but it's, it does. Uh, I think that there was, I think uh, it does track back to people who had power, who were able to pull this off. And there was also the issue of, uh, of Robert Kennedy. That's even crazier with a Saran, with a brainwashing which makes sense because the CIA, MK Ultra had been in position. They'd been playing with hypnotism for a long time, as well as brainwashing. It seems like Sirhan has no, had no agency of his own. And of course, you have the issue of ballistics in the Robert Kennedy assassination, as you do in the Martin Luther King, too. But in, in Robert Kennedy, it's insane to have so many bullets being fired and out of a gun that had only six. To go back to Oswald for a second, um, like similar to the pristine bullet, which was, you know, a marquee piece of evidence in the Warren Commission. To me, the the single most stunning feature of the the facts concerning Lee Harvey Oswald is that he defected to the Soviet Union and then was allowed back into the country with a wife, seemingly with no consequences to him personally or professionally. And then sort of found himself ingratiated into this white Russian community in Dallas and then working for an insane anti-communist like Guy Bannister. So like th those details there to me like make the most compelling case that Oswald was a creature of intelligence or involved in an operation of some kind. Yeah, and the jobs he got, the jobs that Jagger, Jagger Child stole. I mean, he had jobs that were very bizarre jobs, put it that way. Riley Coffee Company, all run by right-wing right people. Uh, and of course, the final job at the book depository, which is owned by a guy who's an anti rabid anti Kennedy man. So, there's so many coincidences. But the, the Oswald case is it was the way we had done business abroad. It was just a continuation of using people. You always use a gunman who looks like a communist uh, or he looks like a, he's nuts. And that's the way things get done. You, you have, it's, a, it's a typical scenario. If, whether you use it in Latin America, you have somebody kill a presidential candidate. It's always a loose gun, a loose cannon. Very rarely is it admitted to being political. One of the more interesting things in the documentary concerning Oswald that I wasn't aware of concerns these sort of mirror plots on Kennedy's life in both Chicago and Tampa yeah. leading up to Dallas and including another figure. I forget his name, uh, Arthur Valley, yeah. who was almost identical to Lee Harvey Oswald in, in many respects, even well, given a job along the parade route at an office building like weeks before Kennedy was supposed to go through Chicago. And then the, I think, I think someone named Lee, uh, gave a tip to the FBI that President Kennedy's life was in danger in Chicago. And then Oswald himself went into the Dallas FBI office, I think, a couple of weeks before he was interviewed. No notes were ever produced regarding that interview. But when you think about Oswald and like his involvement in this, how do you imagine Oswald as an individual? Like what, what did he think he was taking part in? Or his role well, in this was. When you speculate on Oswald, you're going down a rat trap because it's a lot of people have. I personally also would just speculate that he actually liked Kennedy and he knew that Kennedy's life was in danger. And I think he knew that he was in something far bigger than he ever imagined when he started. I do think he had a love of espionage and he got into this thing originally and he was seen as a loose cannon that could be used. That's why he was put in the defector program. 
and so was Thomas Arthur Valley. There were other people in the defective program. In fact, we show this guy, this State Department guy, Otto Otemka, trying to investigate that matter. And he's fired because he's looking into the defective program and who is a defector who's come back to the country. And there's quite a few, apparently. There's more than certainly those two. And he's fired, Otto Otemka. He's one of the first guys who tries to get in on the Oswald Trail. He's fired because of pressure from the CIA. Another really interesting thing that I wasn't aware of before the documentary, could you talk a little bit about a man named Abraham Bolden, who was the first black Secret Service agent assigned to the White House detail? What happened to him after he started um, raising he got, questions? He, a sad story. He got railroaded. You know, he was Kennedy. Kennedy, when he first got into power, the first thing he said, he looked around at his protect his Secret Service detail and he said, why are there no black people here? And he actually insisted that they hire a black people to work around uh, the president. And that was part of his integration of the system. He, had, he passed a law uh, prohibiting f- uh, discrimination in federal jobs. I mean, not federal jobs. Uh, uh, Bolden uh, was an ins- worked closely ins- with, the, with the Kennedy people inside. He was giving them information. You're telling them that things were not great with the Secret Service. That it was sloppy. And he, went, he, went, he traveled with the president. And then eventually he ended up in Chicago. And this plot in Chicago unfolded. Four Cubans uh, were, were seen by a landlady in, a, in, an, in an apartment, strange with guns. And of course, two of them were arrested, but they disappeared after the arrest. Uh, Valley was arrested, but he disappears from the, from the scene. In other words, no, for, no real investigation is, is followed up on. No real investigation. Although we know that there are plots against the president, quite a few. And there, the threats are coming in. In this period, this is another thing that leaves uh, questions of Secret Service reaction and their de- behavior in Dallas when they were so sloppy in Dallas. It, it, it leads one to believe that they were in some way involved. Oliver Stone, I'll, I'll let you go there. I just want to thank you so much for your time. I want to thank you for the movie and uh, for all your movies. Thank you so much. Goodbye, William. Thank you once again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Do you want a man for president who's seasoned through and through? But not so doggone seasoned that he won't try something new. A man who's old enough to know. And young enough to do. Well, it's up to you. It's up to you. It's strictly up to you. All right, so, Aaron, you you cool to talk for a little bit now? Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's just keep it rolling. Uh, that was Oliver Stone, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but... Without further ado, uh, we do have Aaron Good with us for the rest of the episode. Aaron Good, editor at large at Covert Action Magazine. Um, Aaron, just like yeah, you, you listened to our conversation with uh, with Oliver Stone just now. I mean, like, so the 58th anniversary. I mean, like, uh, just just wh- wh- where are your thoughts today on on this anniversary? And just like nearly 60 years later, what the Kennedy assassination means and like what it represents in our sort of our cultural imagination, but also as like an unsolved murder. Right. Well, I I think that it speaks to the power of the perpetrators that it has been scrutinized and hundreds of books written about it. And yet we, it still cannot be solved and the government can still um, withhold these documents that can't possibly that they, it's not that they're withheld for the reasons that they say it's, that that's pretty that's pretty obvious. So we have to reflect on the kind of government that we live in. I've I've been immersed in this case for a, a while because I I got a doctorate in political science and which is a pretty straight laced kind of boring discipline. But I wanted to look at state state crimes and state criminality and the intelligence agencies, un, unstudied largely in political science. And the Kennedy assassination is really useful in terms of giving a window into a number of things that are important and suppressed, like the role of the intelligence agencies, relationship between military intelligence you know, complex to the, the national media, and uh, you know, what the CIA, what these agencies are in relation to capitalism, the system that we that we live under and the and really the forces that they're ultimately beholden to and the forces that brought them into existence. So it's I, the sadness of the day is not like something I reflect on so much on the day because I've spent a lot of time on it. And I've been working on a podcast that is a an accompaniment to Oliver's new documentary. And he has a four hour version of that documentary coming out. The podcast interviews a lot of people that are involved in the actual film itself. Like I have about two hours with James Galbraith and John Newman on Vietnam. 
I have a one with Zach Sklar where he talks about how, how JFK got made in the first place. Oliver left this part out earlier, but it was actually Covert Action Magazine's publishing house that, that produced the Garrison memoir that Ellen Ray gave to Oliver Stone at a conference in Cuba uh, back in 1988, which set him on the path to making JFK. So I agree. I'm in agreement with Oliver's analysis about it. And I, and I would could even, you know, expand on some of these, these things where he talks about the policies that Kennedy had. There was there's much continuity between Eisenhower and what Johnson did. But with Kennedy, he wanted different things with Indonesia, Brazil, uh, Vietnam, uh, with Cuba policy. I mean, Fidel Castro himself said, this is bad news. Everything has changed when he heard what happened. And, and he was right about that. Uh, Patrice Lumumba is a figure that uh, haunts both Kennedy and this movie um, quite a bit. I mean, particularly in, as it regards is like basically Dulles had already gotten his plot to assassinate Lumumba approved as Eisenhower was heading out the door. Kennedy comes in and finds out about it. And uh, basically, you know, is sort of like outraged that Lumumba has been arrested by the, you know, like coup forces and sends, sends, a, sends an official memo saying, uh, get this guy out of prison. Well, what do they do then? They kill him like instantly. And he has to find out about this. Like, um, and like, you know, once again, it's like an example of like what, what Dulles was doing overseas was the like, you know, subversion of democracies and assassinations. What would lead us to believe that Alan Dulles wouldn't do something like that in the United States? Right. That's <laughs> a good question. I mean, he's they put that quote in the movie where he's talking to his biographer, uh, you know, a biographer of Dulles and Dulles at one point, because he always was, um, you know, a duplicitous kind of a, a phony individual who was very good at you know, presenting a facade that belied what he was really thinking. And he just said that little Kennedy, he thought he was a god. Meaning he thought he had a right to like, I don't know, decide policy for the United States after being elected right. president. Exactly. He thought he could he could take on the masters of the universe. And the Malumumba case is the perfect example because Eisenhower wanted him dead. And and I, and this is a case where you do have evidence, documentation of Eisenhower authorizing that assassination. The official CIA line is, is in effect, oh, but we authorized him to be killed on Thursday and he was killed on Friday. So just a Not coincidence. Us. Yeah. Right. But Kennedy, there's that famous picture where he gets the news and he gets it from Adelaide Stevenson, even though the CIA had known about it for a while. And he's just is like, oh, God, this is terrible. OK, so that there you can see the difference between Kennedy and um, Eisenhower, you know, the Eisenhower Dulles brothers before Kennedy. And then. In the Congo, after Kennedy's killed and Johnson takes over, who does Johnson install, you know, as a dictator for the next 30 years? Basically, Lumumba's assassin, Joseph Mobuto, or Mobuto Sesi Seko, he takes that name, right? So this is, you see a, a really clear difference in that, in that case. He had, a, he had a different point of view. And Lumumba was a pan-Africanist, and he gets killed, and they, they don't just kill him, they dissolve his body with acid so they can't you know, bury his remains anywhere and let it turn into a, you know, make a martyr of him. They try to do that. And you can fast forward to today and look at Congo and you can see pictures of little kids who are essentially slave labor, mining cobalt for all of our cell phones, making lots of money for Glencore. Uh, it, it's, you can see the the line there. It's neocolonialism. And you, you said like, you know, after Lumumba was assassinated, the person who ran the country that he was supposed to be the leader of the next three years was his assassin. And I think, you know, if you look at the Kennedy assassination, you can view it in similar light within this country is that the people who killed him essentially have been the people in charge of this country until, you know, now. Up to the present day and, yeah, and can, continuing into the future. And there has to be some element of the CIA. You know, there's some Bill Clinton, when he took office, he tried to get to the bottom of it. So he sent a guy, I think it was Webster Hubble, one of his deputies, and he said, why don't you go over to the CIA and see if you can find out who killed Kennedy? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever he says, right? And then he gets told, um, "No, you don't have the, you don't have the authority for that." So there are, there must be on some level a, a, a class of people charged in the national security state with knowing what the secrets are and what they need to like act against. Because you can see the way that the, the corporate media, re, you know, reports about Kennedy to this day, and so on, and other issues like. Frank Olson's assassination and never get to the bottom of that. The, the drug scandals with Air America or the Contras and 
all there's a number of things that are just this dark quadrant of national security state chicanery that that we are not privy to and it's not controlled by democratically elected officials it's this foreign policy blob that was created by capitalist forces and operates under a cloak of secrecy well like into this like broader like motive question like the third part of the documentary the donald sutherland the mr x part of jfk the movie it's like after world war ii you have America emerges as the most powerful country in the world and decides like, hey, we're going to run the world and we're going to run it for good. But in order to do that, we need to create this permanent state of war, a permanent wartime economy. And, you know, this is what Eisenhower was talking about in his farewell address, even though he had a lot to do with it. But like it becomes this question of like, as Oliver alluded to, where is this money going to be spent? Is it going to be spent on three trillion dollars a year in Afghanistan or are we going to have health care for anyone in this country? And I think I think the answer is like, I mean, the, the, the through violence, I think like these questions have been answered by the people in charge of our government. Yeah, you, you just you said it. This is it's funny that you mentioned that because I'm doing a rewrite of my dissertation. Um, it's going to be published in April uh, by Skyhorse. Oliver was kind enough to blurb it for me, um, which was a big help. And I just added a section on the birth of the of the of the military industrial complex. And it essentially I learned things doing this that I had suspected but didn't really know in 1948 there's a war scare it's pretty much fabricated using you know different tidbits to like scare people into boosting the economy with uh military spending and a lot of it is to save the aerospace industry which is struggling because of the end of the war and its biggest creditors are so it's not just these companies like boeing lockheed martin and all this it's banks like Chase Manhattan, they were the biggest creditor. That's Rockefeller money. That's like the titan, really, of titans in terms of U.S. capitalism. And they stood to lose a lot of money. And so they they have this war scare, and it saves the industry in 1948, but it, it's not sufficient. So they, they ramp it up to another level. And the outcome of this sort of scaremongering about the Cold War is NSC 68, which calls for a massive it's a 1950 document calls for massive rearmament against the Soviet Union. And it's not just about the economic downturn that they're suffering after the war ends because you don't have this government stimulus into the economy. It's also a way to deal with, and they write about this in NSC 68, the dollar gap, which meant that with martial aid money running out, it was going to be difficult to maintain the the, the capitalist system as these planners at Council on Foreign Relations had you know, put together during the war, um, you know, funded by Wall Street, of course, the think tank, right? They needed to deal with this dollar gap issue, which is how are they going to be able to purchase our goods? And the, the massive military spending meant that it would put, the U.S. would run like balance of payments deficits, and then this would help in both in Asia, a, dollar, a potential dollar gap issue, and in Europe. And what they didn't want was Europe to go neutral, which meant that they could potentially buy from the Soviets or buy from Americans, whichever had the best deal, and it would be okay. They were really paranoid about this, and they spoke about it in apocalyptic terms. What they're really talking about is maintaining hegemony over global capitalism after World War II so that capital and trade flows would go across the Pacific to America and back, and then across Europe. To America and back. And this is maintaining this as you still see it today. Look at the reaction about Nord Stream and Ger- between Germany and Russia and the US. It's like it's this, it repeats itself. Um, I just want to get back to the, uh, I, I know I brought up Charles de Gaulle before, but I mean, to me, that's a potent example because it shows that, I mean, like you, you do not need as a leader to drift too far outside a very narrow consensus. Like you don't need like, to be anywhere close to being a radical to basically get targeted for assassination or have someone look the other way when someone takes a shot at you or, you know, or actually be killed yourself. It's definitely true. And I mean, a funnier case, uh, I'd say funny, but funny, tragic, something morbidly more, more, amusing, more farcical is Jimmy Carter, because Jimmy Carter is a Rockefeller man. The Trilateral Commission selected him, handpicked him to be their guy, which was Brzezinski and Rock, David Rockefeller. And they boost that he gets all this great media coverage and he comes from nowhere and he's a media fabrication, but not a terrible guy as these people go. So he fires like uh, George W. George H.W. Bush, replaces him with Stansfield Turner. 
Stansfield Turner fires people like Tom Shackley and Ray Kleins, these really super gangsterish fellows in the CIA. And he, Carter is, you know, has all these other trilateral people around him, but he's still too progressive for David Rockefeller. David Rockefeller becomes one of the characters behind the October surprise, you know, or counter surprise that, you know, delays the release of the hostages and so on in Iran um, and leads to Ronald Reagan's election. So in this case, you have a guy who doesn't even like his own handpicked puppet and sort of helps to make sure he gets defeated in 1980. It's, it's wild. Yeah. And Car- with Carter, it, it, it's, I mean, Operation Cyclone, obviously everything that you mentioned in foreign policy, but he was also one of the hatchet men who helped destroy the, the democratic and labor Alliance. He deregulated credit. He deregulated trucking, several key industries it's he, but he just didn't go that extra 3% and that was enough to get rid of him. Well, as you mentioned, like he, he, he fired a lot of people involved in covert, <laughs> covert operations in the intelligence community. And like, what are these guys like, did they just get another job? Like, no, they kept doing what they've always been doing. And then in Reagan and Bush, they found the perfect people. I mean, Bush, the former director of the CIA to just get right back in charge there and just be like business as usual, stores open. Let's go. Yeah, exactly. And and a lot of that, some of this untold part of aspects of this, we still don't really know, but we can piece together. The Safari Club in Iran established there with Iranian and, and Saudi intelligence. Richard Nixon fires Richard Helms and makes him the ambassador to Iran. So Helms is over there in Iran. That's the worst guy of all. He was probably the top guy at CIA involved in the Kennedy assassination. He's also the, the grandson of the, the founding president of the Bank for International Settlements. That's his, his middle name is Magara and Gates Magara is the, the, the BIS guy, which was like this Nazi bank. It's like the worst of the worst of the supranational financial establishment. And that's what Helms represented. And he set up that safari club over there with help of from um, uh, Adnan Khashoggi, right? And that was a way to deal mm-hmm. with, to outsource CIA chicanery, because for a while the Congress was actually investigating the CIA. So they just, this capitalist, sh- you know, shenanigan machine just is privatized for a bit. And probably elements of those are what come to eventually screw Carter in 1980. By the way, I will, I, I must credit Oliver Stone with portraying Richard Helms as Satan himself in the director's cut of Nixon with the, uh, the black eyes scene. I know we ha- Oliver and I have had a little bit of an argument over this, which is a, a funny argument. And I, I don't know, I can't figure out if this, if I'm being sycophantic or anti sycophantic, but I basically think he got Nixon just right pretty much. And that there's more about that business with like that scene you described where Nixon's in trying to talk to Helms about getting these Bay of Pigs files and things. There's actually more to that story. And Oliver's kind of backed off that a little bit, but I'm like saying, no, no, you're, you're wrong. You're wrong about being wrong because I think he actually, I I looked into it more and I'm trying to persuade him about, about this, but we'll see if that, that ever comes to pass. Yeah. And I mean, in Nixon, Nixon refers to the Bay of Pigs thing. He refers to it obliquely as the beast and this idea that like he's not really in control of the government and that like his role as president is only to kind of like placate and keep at arm's length this beast represented by Richard Helms and everything that mongoose, you know, in quotation marks really represents, which is like an ongoing threat to his life, basically. Yeah, I I mean, I find Watergate. I, I this is like I wrote two chapters on it. In, in my dissertation and uh, worked with Peter Del Scott or talked to him a little bit about it and, and I got some it feedback from him. And there's more to that than just the Bay of Pigs thing. There's actually an earlier visit before Watergate happened where, Ken, where Nixon goes into uh, Helms's office and he says, hey, uh, we really want those Bay of Pigs files, you know, I mean, there's things we got to know about, not because of me, but because it might come up, you know, the, he says the whole who shot Jack Angle. Was it who was responsible for that? Was it was it that was it the Soviets? Was it the Cubans? Was it Nixon? Was it the CIA? And this dirty tricks department, you know, I'll protect you guys, but I, I just want to know this stuff. So so Nixon was trying to get leverage over the CIA at different times, even before Watergate. He stupidly thought that having Hunt in his employ would allow him to have leverage rather than the other way around, which is what ended up probably happening. So the the Watergate. Dallas angles are fascinating as well. But, you know, in, in, in this sort of like arc of American history from Kennedy, from his murder 
to Lyndon Johnson and then to Nixon and Watergate and his resignation. I mean, like, don't, isn't like just sort of like everything about like the second half of the 20th century and like America as a, a country and a global hegemon, isn't it all of it contained in like the transition between those three men and what they tried to do or failed to do in office? Yeah, and I, I think that Reagan, his election represents really uh, uh, the consolidation of it. But, but honestly, getting rid of Nixon... Nixon was a liberal, as, as weird as that sounds, and he was also a bit of a nationalist, meaning that he did not like the fact that Japan and Western countries in Western Europe were accumulating dollars and, and potentially weakening US, the U.S. economy. And he wanted to strengthen U.S. domestic production and engage in some protectionism. And the Rockefeller wing of you know, the establishment, your more capitalist uh, you know, commercially minded people, they did not like this. So Nixon ran afoul of those of those people. And then he also ran afoul of the hawkish military people because of detente with Russia, you know, arms control treaties and recognizing China. So the Nixon thing is fascinating because he was an anti-communist, kind of a wacko. And yet the more you look at what happened to him, it, it you know, he did try to struggle with the CIA. He had them dig up the family jewels specifically because he thought they were screwing him with Watergate and he thought he could get leverage over them that way. So he fires Richard Helms and replaces him with his own guy, Schlesinger, uh, in order to try to do that. But it, he's unsuccessful. Well, I mean, like, regardless of, like, the political differences between, or, you know, party differences between Kennedy and Nixon, I think in both of them you see, you see kind of, like, the last attempts of the American president as an institution thinking that it, power is vested in the office itself. That an American president through, you know, democratic consent and just force of will could direct American policy um, on behalf of the American people. Yes, it's it's sad. It's sad what happened to Bernie Sanders. I, he was the most popular politician. The chicanery of that whole primary process was absurd, although at least in Bernie's case, his, you know, his cranium is still intact. So <laughs> it, it could be worse for those who try to meddle with the masters of the universe. But it was you know, what a farce that was. Joe Biden was very unpopular. It was, it was, it was ridiculous that we have this guy as a president. There's a line towards the end of the documentary where uh, David Talbot says that you can draw a direct line between what happened in Dallas and the current horror show that Americans are living through. And I thought of that in light of the fact that right now, as we're recording this, in Dealey Plaza in Dallas, are dozens to, if not hundreds, of QAnon supporters who have gathered there in the belief that, like, JFK Jr. will reveal himself, or even, I don't know, like, the Kennedy, like, something will happen, something momentous. The occluded Kennedy will return. And that, like, I'm just, Aaron, what do you make of the uh, the symbolism of JFK and, like, the feeling that, like, you know, what, what it augurs is that, like, no one really tr has any confidence in America anymore or trusts any of our leaders or institutions. But, like, how do you feel that, like, mutating into being, like, a central tenet of belief in the QAnon conspiracy theory lore? I, I mean, it cannot be an, an organic phenomenon that has emerged out of a healthy democratic civil society. <laughs> uh, to me, it reminds me of if you study the Kennedy assassination more, there's one character named Carrie Thornley who was friendly with Oswald and involved in a lot of ways in setting up Oswald as a communist. You know, he was very useful to the Warren Commission and so on. And he wrote a book about Oswald before Oswald killed Kennedy. And he was in Guy Bannister's office and knew a lot of these same people that Oswald knew in New Orleans. And then later he sets up this thing called Operation Mindfuck, which Hat, which talked about how it was a satirical thing and they would publish in Playboy and other things and they would say, oh yeah, it's the Bavarian Illuminati that's behind all the governments and they're pulling all the strings, right? So it's a way to, and he was a, let's accept the hypothesis that he was a CIA asset or an intelligence asset of some kind. And here he is, you know, perpetrating this kind of, sh of uh, you know, misinformation, disinformation out there in, in a way that was like delegitimizing conspiratorial suspicions that people would have, right? It's a way it, these people are idiots. Like, oh, yes, yeah, it must be the Illuminati doing this, right? Which, you know, this is the same time they're doing Operation Chaos and so on. And so I have to imagine that this QAnon thing is a, is a way to taint 
No, the, the Kennedy assassination makes it pulls the curtain back on the kind of regime that we actually live under. And so these QAnon people are tainting it with, the, you know, the taint of their, you know, gullibility and stupidity. It has to be some kind of operation, I would, I would guess. I mean, I, I just can't believe that they would come across it. It's too perfect. I do think it's interesting that one of the promulgators of uh, Pizzagate and then QAnon was a Navy intelligence officer. I, I, I mean, I do think... Um, I think if you go back and you look at like the nineties, like Bo grits type shit that there's always going to be something that runs parallel to a horrifying thing. The government is doing where, you know, whether it's NAFTA or Ruby Ridge or whatever, you have these people ready to go who are already insane where you're like, Oh, um, let's just roll this in with people who think that there are still like, there are still prisoners of war in Cambodia. That we're just that we're just purposely not getting with people who sell gold through direct mail. Um, I also I don't know. I think that like now, you know, just thinking about what you said about Biden, I, I feel like a lot of the function now is different from the '90s. In that, I think that there's a, a, a lot of what we see is just supposed to demoralize people. Like QAnon serves a function if you're like an insane person or if you are checked out of the political process. It sort of keeps it sort of tampers down your potency and your how much you can become a part of something larger. But the other purpose of seeing it, if you're not, if you're not part of it, if you're not prone to do that, is to see it and just completely give up on your fellow American and give up on yourself and give up on everything to just feel shitty and demoralized all the time. And that is like, I don't think they always really wanted to go with Biden that much, but I think he's, there is, to make that the guy that beats Bernie serves their purpose just as well because it's like, yeah, see, fuck you. This is this is us standing over you in the end zone. Yeah, it could have been anybody. I mean, well, not anybody, anybody but Bernie. It could have been Pete. If Pete, if Pete Mania had taken off, then they would have been like, all right, this guy is fine too. Um, it's it, it's it's wild. But you're 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 right about it being demoralized, and I think that's all they have now. They don't have any unit. There's no attempts to really have a unifying myth or not even a, a unifying vision that's articulated that you actually expect to, to people to rally behind. And I think that they've really, you know, you've got Russiagate, which is absurd. It comes from the intelligence community. QAnon, I have to imagine also. And, and, you know, it's pretty clear that we're being subjected to like a lot of divide and rule tactics as though we are, you know, a, a, a target of, of, of imperialism of a kind. I mean, it might, Pete obviously would have been fine as nobody would have stopped him from being president, but what that whole primary showed was that uh, the next thing never materialized. The next model for the voters to care about didn't materialize. It ended up having to be Biden because he was the one who stood for the party itself for, for the democratic party, like as an apparatus and, and also for the lingering uh, positive feelings people had for the Obama administration uh, their nostalgic yearning for that time before Trump. Uh, they tried to to have a new brand for the Democratic Party. Pete was one attempt. I mean, there were 20 people there. Uh, all of them would have been amenable to the party itself and to Capitol, but none of them were able to gain any sort of excitement outside of the very narrow uh, band of media-obsessed early primary voters and I think what that means is, is that like, they're going to keep having to run people for office, <laughs> they keep having to run people for the presidency, but if they aren't able to, to have some sort of story, some sort of narrative and some sort of branding that makes it worthwhile, uh, they're going to stop being a credible alternative to the Republicans. And the system, whatever else it needs, it needs that. It needs the give and take. It needs the turnismo between the two parties. And the Democrats at this point and in defeating Bernie uh, really destroyed any viable alternative to just continue, continual slide into irrelevance. Not to get too much into primary and Democratic stuff, not to zoom too much in, but it does seem... It, it seems like every four years, that's when the Democrats decide that they're an actual party every time there's a presidential primary or presidential election. And that seemed to come back. It's now really, really coming back to bite them. I do wonder how that portends with other things degenerating 
it, it, that would be maybe an optimistic thing in America if something worse didn't always come. Yeah, I feel like the the crumbling of the empire is the opportunity to they are not going to be able the, the creation of the empire and the creation of this Rumpelstiltskin effect that they get from owning the dollar it, it is it's impossible to even really wrap your mind around how it has you know perverted our institutions and changed politics it really was the the establishment of the post Bretton Woods system made peace with those capitalist centered parts of the of the establishment and the militarist parts because they can both have whatever they want the banks through the federal reserve system have the ability to create as much money out of thin air and loan as much money to each other to buy up everything they want to in the world and the military has its budgets as well and the inflation gets exported to other countries who collect a dollar the dollars or treasury notes in their reserves in the place that gold used to be in this is a power that the us has established for itself and if, as that starts to crumble and countries are, are trading amongst themselves and other in their own currencies and so on, and the Belt and Road Initiative in, in Asia seems to be unstoppable at this point, can the Chinese and other people point to you know, success that they are having in making their own people's lives better and be, that, be the good example that the U.S. has always tried to crush since the end of World War II? I mean, this, this seems to be an opportunity to present the ruling elite in America with the obvious evidence of their own failures and their own defaults. Do you think um, one of our possible futures, yeah, this is a weirdly optimistic one, that American politics just becomes like royal watching. It just becomes a soap opera between the ugliest and most boring but strangest people just a, every few years, like a, a joust between, you know, Marjorie Taylor Green and a woman who left the CIA three years ago. And like royals, like monarchies uh, in in Europe, it just it doesn't really mean anything because China just runs every every everyone has decided that like we need to sort of keep America going as the part of the world where these people buy, but we can't let them run the show anymore. Really, I do not know how what it is that holds. Why well, I know a little bit of it actually. What holds Europe enthralled in the United States? A lot of it is just brute force. Like I I spoke to Ola Tanander who's at the Oslo Peace Research Institute. And he told me some of the conversations he'd had with like top military generals in Scandinavia and uh, other places in Europe. And he, he said that there are like secret treaties that basically assert that the U.S. has the right to like intervene anytime in, in some of these countries. I'm going to go back and add some of that. That's one of the last additions I'm going to make to my book. But it's like, it's, it's wild. And you do wonder like, why do the French and the Germans, like, why are they still listening to America? And, and how do they, how do we still have any prestige in these places? It's, it's, and eventually I think it's uh, uh, the illusion of our omnipotence is, is going to evaporate. And then what are they going to do? What are they going to do then? I, I don't, I can't predict when that would happen, but it seems like it has to. It's just, it's such a shit show in this country. Well, it's hard to, it's hard to keep the military together as this, as this uh, reliable, salient threat against everything as we have, if everything else, every other part of American society is degenerating and fragmenting, how do you how do you keep that together? They're not even making they're not even making Hellcats anymore. I mean, Felix, you you talked about I, I heard you on True and on talking about um, the Gaddafi thing, which is a hugely important story. But the U.S. did that, and they they they've taught people the rest of the world learned some lessons. Russia and China learned that they can't abstain from these UN votes and that the U.S. cannot be relied upon to, to make agreements. Other, other people learned that if you're that not to give up your weapons, like Korea, Korea learned what happens. I mean, basically, if you have, you know, a, a deterrent, you know, in your military, don't think that you can give it up through negotiations with the U.S. unless you want to end up sodomized with the bayonet and have the snuff film put on YouTube and have Hillary Clinton cracking jokes about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants that. So it's the U.S. is is that sort of that way of running things is 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 going to is, is coming back to haunt them, I think. Well, I mean, like, it's just like just like uh, to, to refer back to the, the anniversary. I'm like, you know, the, the Kennedy assassination is often talked about as this kind of like primal violation of like the American America's like self-confidence and self-image. And like, look, it, it, it was all pretty rotten before Kennedy. But like more than that, I think it's like the first in this like a, a long process of like these huge public events that take place that nobody really 
believes the official account of but like but but we have no alternative otherwise like they're just they go on unresolved unpunished like it's just they they just continue on and i think it just leads to this sense that like articulated or not that we're just like not a real country like i mean this is the feeling that i had like after the iraq war that like nobody involved in planning or doing that fucking atrocity has been punished at all it's just like how do you believe that you live in a real country that you're a citizen of when like these things can keep happening over and over again but without any compelling resolution or, or consequences for any of the people involved in it. Yeah, there was one guy who was who went to jail for uh, related to the uh, Bush Cheney CIA torture. And that was John Kiriakou, a friend of mine who does who's helping me with the podcast now. And um, they so he went to jail for exposing it. OK, that's yeah. the, those are the only people who, who do get punished. So, yeah, it's a lawless at the top. There is lawlessness and it's been institutionalized. Like Carl Schmidt wrote, sovereign is he who decides the exception. The exception is the exception to the rule of law. And the national security state has assumed that role and it is, it is shrouded in state secrecy. So we don't even know when they are asserting it and how they are asserting it. They use their own techniques of the clandestine arts to perpetrate political violence under with plausible deniability. And it has carried over as you allude to these issues that these things that we never get to the bottom of you know peter del scott calls these deep events and the really important ones he calls them structural deep events meaning that they have the power to alter you know political history and politics in the u.s and that they and they invariably increase the level of government secrecy in the system and so these deep events these structural deep events they're dismissed by the mainstream as conspiracy theory but you know, a, a lot of the prevailing liberal ideologies are that the rule of law prevails and that democracy is a, is a real thing and that, you know, we are a country where, where the public is sovereign and so on and so forth. But, you know, the Kennedy assassination is a perfect example because you can see not only do you see the president get killed in a way that, the, that, that where the state's narrative of it is absurd, but his brother is the top lawman in the country and realizes, makes the assessment that he is powerless to do anything about it unless he becomes president. And on his way to becoming president, he gets shot in the head, in the back of the head at point blank range by a guy who's six feet in front of him. So these are things that, that, we, that we have to deal with. But the problem is if you start to like actually think of like what this means, it narrows your, it, it's a challenge to most people's political perspectives you're going to be outside of the mainstream if you start saying like, if you start saying these things all the time, because even if people are vaguely, yeah, I don't believe the Warren Commission, support for that fell for 8% to 8% after they showed the Zapruder from on TV. And yet, what can you do about it? It's it's a conundrum. It's not just like, you know, uh, maybe alienates you from mainstream politics, but I mean, it 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 narrows your very idea of like what politics is. Because if you can know about all these things more or less openly and discuss them on podcasts or make movies about them, but uh, the, 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 the fictions themselves like, are, are, un, are unaltered or like the people, the, the principles involved in it are undisturbed entirely because of what, the things you talked about, because of these secret laws and secret power that they've spent decades accruing for themselves. And it's just sort of like, yeah, you're, you're not really living in a, in a country. You're not really living like in a democratic society. No, and it's, uh, you know, Sheldon Wolin, he didn't get into the details of specific state crimes, but he called it inverted totalitarianism, where, because totalitarianism just meant, you know, it was, there was no element of civil society that could act as to counterbalance the power of the regime, except that in under, instead of like it being like Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union, this totalitarianism sort of disengages people and disempowers them rather than like rallying them to like the cause or whatever. And so that's that that's sort of the, the situation that we're in. I'd like to see the rise of a Marxist, you know, materialist, because these people running things are obviously people with a lot of the money and power. That's not that hard to figure out. And they own, they they run the security apparatus, which by definition conspires all the time. Like they have people like operations and plans. And like, what is that? They're secret, secret, illegal, violent things carried out by people, which is the definition of a conspiracy, right? So we have state-sanctioned conspiracies that are institutionalized and ongoing, like the operations arm of the CIA. So 
but on behalf of capital. So not to be like a Bircher or a QAnon nutter who thinks it's like, oh yeah, they're all conspiring so that they can go into the Pete's place and, with their pedophile ring. You know, that, that, that's not really logical. It's one of, people that own everything. That's, that's the position you want to be in. And that's what this national security state, you know, it serves to bring about. I think the problem for a Marxist uh, attempt to like assimilate the reality of the, of the deep state, the reality of this structure uh, into their narrative is that at the end of the day, you are telling a narrative about people and about choices made conspiracies made by people in power. Uh, and when you're doing that, people want a motive. They want to understand why are they doing this? Right. And, to maintain power uh, doesn't really work for uh, a lot of people because, uh, you know, that they believe the thing that these powerful people are making is a society that is increasingly anti-human, like at a basic level. It's, it's, it's destroying the planet. It's destroying social cohesion. It's destroying what it is to be a human. And what person, even if they're rich, would want to do that? Uh, and so that's why it's very difficult for conspiracy emphasizing narratives not to end up having to have some end state uh, a, a, a villain that is somehow human but not human, like a, a reptile or an alien or a member of a certain uh, religious and ethnic group that has some sort of so that has values that are not human values and. The thing is, is that you don't really need that if, because capitalism uh, is a algorithm that is inhuman and that people, even at the very top, they might be benefiting from it and they might carry out conspiracies to perpetuate its uh, domination, but they are fundamentally at the end of the day, not in control of it. Like there are no people at the top of this thing. There is only this algorithm. There is only the value form and there is profit extraction. And that is hard to pitch to regular people narratively. It's not as satisfying as the idea of cabals and the idea of people with who are somehow not us doing things uh, uh, to us instead of really everybody along for the ride in a certain respect uh, being pulled towards a uh, total annihilation of, of life uh, without anybody in the system, even those behind closed doors making these plans, uh, really wanting that to be the case. Yeah, it's, a, it's frightening to think about these. It's not just capitalism, it's civilization. There are people, civilization is hierarchical and the people at the top enjoy more power and wealth because of exploitation, this dynamic of exploitation. And you have myths to rationalize it. We all have things that we do to rationalize our position in our own mind, where we, in, like I buy, oh, I need a new PlayStation game. Starving kids in Africa could maybe, you know, be helped by $2 a day, but I'm going to buy a PlayStation game, right? We all have these things that we do that are to rationalize our own position and some of the things that we enjoy. And if you try to extrapolate what it's like for these elites that, you know, do have their hands on the levers of power. And I, and I, I think it's a, you know, it's a rotating class and some of the people that do the worst things are really more the servants of the money power itself, the people with all the money, but it's a human thing to detach from worrying about some of these more serious things. Cause if you did, you'd be so depressed to think about, genocide on the area where you're standing right now today or where you're living today. And if you thought about that all the time, you couldn't function. And the, these elites are probably more in that direction than anybody else. The people that said like, okay, Indonesia, huge gold mine in West Papua, biggest gold mine in the world. Sukarno wants to give it to the communists. This is a problem. We'll stage this provocation with these generals. And in the aftermath of that, uh, we're going to have them kill up all, kill the communists. They just murder a million to, to two million, three million, and it's just like to them, it's a way to like solve these problems of power that they're faced with. And it's, but it's a, it's a, it's not that regular people do this thing on anywhere near that magnitude. But there is civilization. It, it kind of allows you to, and it forces you to accept 
a certain amount of brutality and exploitation that comes with your position. I think that's kind of the point of uh, the in the last 30 years, last 30, 40 years, the mushrooming of the national security state is, I mean, A, a I think one of the key, one of the unique features of it is that it always has to keep rolling. It always has to be keep growing. It always has to keep expanding. I always liked what Michael Parenti said about gangster capitalism and he is an amazing lecture on this as it relates to JFK, but I would almost call the last 40 years uh, pillhead capitalism. You always there always has to be a new scam. There always has to be a new thing. You have to new new bit of copper you have to strip. You have to keep it going or else you go into withdrawals and you die. Uh, but I think since the 80s and especially since 9-11 as the 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 security state has exploded and the, especially the contractor state after 9-11, uh, the, the people that helped turn Virginia blue. Um, the, the function of that beyond just needing to always get bigger and gain momentum is so there aren't as many single individuals who this will weigh so heavily on someone who is a cog in this machine can go, Oh, well, you know, like, what we did here was bad, but, you know, I, I work on the fucking Malaysia desk. All I do is Malaysia shit. All, 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 I, all I do is, you know, su uh, support for the CIA hit teams that we have in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. It's, it's, a way to, it's a way so that no individual player is that important. Anyone who proves themselves or stays in it long enough shows themselves to be a, a true believer, a true servant of Satan uh, in the mold of an Angleton or someone, they get to go up there. They get to carry more of that evil on their back. But for the, the people who are just their, you know, middle-class people going in and out, the point is that they're not caring that much and they do not have to think about it that much. I think. Yeah. They they keep us that way. They don't, this is, don't worry yourself about it. It's like the Jack Nicholson monologue in, um, in a uh, few good men, right? Mm -hmm. like, you don't want to know. <laughs> you don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties. You want me on that wall. It's, it's just that's that is the attitude that they have for us. And it's true for a lot of people, especially, you know, uh, liberals. Uh, they just they can't deal with this. They're the they're kind of the pivotal class. And I'm glad you guys have had Catherine Liu on here in the past because her writing on this like PMC mentality is there's a different version of it that prevails at the national security state, although they're blending now with like those CI, those woke CIA ads and things. Oh, it's those just, are great. I love those. It's, it's, it's really wild the way that they try to legitimate and obscure, you know, their own, what, what's going on. Um, just like a uh, uh, last question for me here. Like, I don't know, like uh, in, in thinking about the Kennedy assassination is just like, all all just sort of like all all implications all sort of grand narratives about what this implies aside is still technically an unsolved murder do you think it's useful in that context to think about the cia as basically the history's grandest and still most ongoing criminal conspiracy yes i think that no gang of criminals has ever had the impact on world historic events that they have shaping you know the destinies of congo Indonesia, Brazil, you know, just during, just as the transition from Kennedy to Johnson, for example, but like, you know, Iranian history in the Middle East. And of course, but the bigger thing is the, the national security state, this colossus, but the CIA is involved in the, the worst, the worst parts of it. And um, I actually think that if you were to, for the elites in America, as this thing is kind of crumbling, it would be in their, I think it would be in their enlightened self-interest to allow some of these facts to be brought above board because they've sort of created a situation that is volatile for them and it's leading to crises that are not going to leave them untouched perhaps. And so some sort of change that would be dramatic would be like acknowledging what happened with the Kennedy assassination. I think that this could be lead to a, a breakthrough in terms of our consciousness and maybe well, something I, I like think that should help. I think they're trying to do that, but I think it's very telling that a couple months ago that they were just like, oh, here's the documents. UFOs are real. Hey, hey bye, everybody. Have yeah. a good weekend. And, and now, and then Biden last week is just saying, oh, we sorry, we can't release any more of these Kennedy documents because they present some sort of unidentifiable harm to national security and intelligence gathering. Right. Yeah, he, he was not going to, he was not going to release those. That, I wasn't too shocked about it. I would be also be shocked, even though it's silly at this point and pointless. 
Gavin Newsom and releasing Sirhan, I bet he doesn't. I bet he ignores the law and the advice of the parole board. And I bet they keep. I would put money on him keeping Sirhan in jail too, because that seems it's okay. To be it's okay because Hinkley's out and he's in the stew right now. <laughs> down tracks. Uh, yeah, he's still out. He's out there singing his songs. I, I can't believe that he's on Twitter tweeting about about these about these things. He seems like um like a. MK Ultra case or something. I mean, uh, he was like the son of a close family friend of the Bush. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, no, the, the guy Hinkley's, he had dinner with the Hinkleys right? and the Bushes go back in Texas to like the 1950s, I think. Yeah, he was part of, as I understand it, he and Mark David Chapman both worked. This gets into like the weeds of you know, <laughs> yeah, alternative history. But they both worked for World Vision, which was a yes, CIA. Yes, it's cut this out. weird ministry, this weird mm. CIA like funded uh, World Christian Ministry. Yeah, yeah. So that's a strange coincidence. And they both all didn't they both whip out. Catch her in the rye after, or have it on their possession. There's some other weird angle there. So it's just like this, which it, they it sounds so nutty to even talk about it. But this is the kind of things that they do. There was a CIA officer, part of the Artichoke or MK Ultra project. He tried this these techniques on his secretary, and it actually worked. His secretary picked up a gun and attempted to shoot. It was unloaded, but attempted to shoot someone that they've been working on. So like you know, like what kind? Well, you know they've. If they want to get rid of anybody, it's very, you know, very easy to do, I think. Well, uh, I, I think I think what I learned from the, uh, the the culmination of this conversation is if we ever want to do anything about that, step one, begin the process of owning everything important <laughs> in the world. So start buying up now. Start buying up all the land, resources, and oh, yeah, and control of the U.S. dollar as global reserve currency. If we can get a handle on that, maybe we can pry back some of this stuff. That's where crypto comes in. <laughs> I, I, um, something I've been doing that's been a kind of intelligent is, um, I, you know, I've been accruing U.S. dollars as anyone should, but um, I've also been flushing money down the toilet to decrease the M2 money supply, so my dollar is worth more. <laughs> yeah, this is a good strategy. I don't know what to even think about investments or anything like that. It seems like a lot of this stuff is so precarious, and that they can. QE uh, invents a zillion dollars. I think QE plays a part in what happened with the, you know, shale oil boom and other and other things. It, it's getting more and more obviously fictitious, this whole this whole system. If you guys follow Michael Hudson, the way he talks about the economy and, and such, very important stuff to wrap your mind around. It's, it's, it's really <laughs> Eminem huge. Obama is a great yeah. follow. Everyone, we everyone, just, everyone throw him a follow. Yeah. Aaron, we have a we 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 have a friend that like uh we've we've known for like almost a decade. Who's also named Michael Hudson, <laughs> and he's—I uh, mean, I don't even really want to just—I I can't even encapsulate what he does. He's the world's best geoguesser player. He finds the best guys on Facebook. But I've also heard great things about the other Michael Hudson. I think people should follow both of them. Yeah, he's brilliant. He was the highest-paid economic consultant after he was the first person to figure out what had happened with the uh, collapse of Bretton Woods, and he was working at the Hudson Institute—no relation to Stanford University. What and. He worked with um, got that job. Uh, Herman Kahn, right? The guy that Dr. Strangelove is partly Holy shit, model yeah. after. And Herman Kahn was like, this is great. You've basically outlined the con perfectly, right? <laughs> so it was, <laughs> it, which was true. It was the, the way that the U.S. had it had it set up. But it's, it, you know, how long can they can they keep this going? The scary thing or, or, or something to really take note of that is those three capital firms that control basically major, controlling interest. So they manage controlling interest. In essentially every industry, it's um, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, right? When you add up their holdings, it, it, it's never been so concentrated as it is today. And this is ownership of media, pharmaceuticals, the, the, the major banks, the, the defense contractors, pretty much everything. This is new in the history of capitalism. Not that there wasn't wealth concentration before, but this new system is, it needs to be, it's some sort of socialism is the obvious and only answer. And yet they're really going to try not to allow that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and, and when you describe a situation like that, this intense, intense concentration of like who actually owns everything. I mean, you can look at that sort of optimistically in one regard, because, because like there's never been fewer of them and more of us, but the problem is essentially everybody works for them. So it's it's a it's sort of like a it's hard to work around that you know what I mean? Yeah, the only thing worse than being uh, exploited by capitalism is not being exploited by capitalism, yeah. and and that's the situation that that, that people the people are in. So it's 
but it seems so clear that like, would you rather Amazon be Jeff Bezos or would you rather we all own that? For example, it's, it's amazingly undemocratic the way that this is developing, but nobody cares. I mean, I won't say nobody cares. Nobody can do anything about it. We'll leave it there for today. 58th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. I want to thank Aaron Good, a covert action magazine. And once again, thank you so much to Oliver Stone. Can I also get a plug in for the podcast, which has just plug launched away. today? It is on it's at, on Patreon, Covert Action Bulletin. And we are carrying, among other things, a companion series uh, on the JFK assassination uh, that is a companion to Oliver's new documentaries. And the producer of the, of the podcast is Jim, Jim DiGenio, who's the, the co-creator of JFK Revisited, Oliver Stone's new movie. And we also have a number of other interview subjects like Pepe Escobar and Peter Dale Scott um, coming up. And uh, there's a lot of stuff coming out there. So it's on, they can find us on Patreon. And uh, it's a, the Covert Action Magazine is a venerable institution. It's cool to be doing this. A uh, link to the Patreon will be in the episode description. Gentlemen, until next time, bye-bye. All right. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Aaron. Do you like a man who answers straight, a man who's always fair? We'll measure him against the others, and when you compare, you cast your vote for Kennedy and the change that's overdue. So it's up to you, it's up to you, it's strictly up to you. Yes, it's Kennedy, 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 Kennedy. Kennedy.